Welcome to Explore, Explain. This is a long-form video and podcast series sharing conversations with data visualisation designers and developers from around the world. Each episode explores the detailed hidden thinking behind a single project or a series of related works to explain the what, the why and the how of the design process. There are some wonderful guests and some wonderful projects to learn about. So let's jump in to today's episode with your host, Andy Kirk. Hello and welcome to another episode of Explore Explain, Season 4, Episode 6. And in this episode, I'm delighted to welcome Chimdi and Woso all the way from Canada. Chimdi, it's great to meet you, sir. I've been following your work for a good few years now. For the benefit of the viewers and listeners, can you just introduce yourself, who you are, where you are, what you do, please? Awesome. Thanks so much, Andy. I've heard so much about you and it's finally great to actually talk to you as well. Very kind. So thanks again for having me. Yeah. So I guess for those who don't know me, uh, my name is Chimdi Nwonsu. I currently reside in British Columbia, Canada. And I guess I was born in Nigeria in case that's an interesting tidbit for anyone. So I am Nigerian. And currently I consider myself a data visualization specialist and designer. But my actual job title, I'm a database manager for a media company. And I spend majority of my time basically helping people see data, but I try to make them see it beautifully. I try to make it very appealing to them. And that's essentially what I do. I also work with clients on the side and anything to do with database, if you want to hop on and do it, I'll do it with you, right? So that's that's really what I do. But um Right now, I do work full time and I have like a side gig as well. Excellent stuff. Yeah. And as you said there, making things beautiful and appealing. I mean, that is certainly a characteristic of your work, which I've been following um, excitedly for years. And it's therefore great to have a chance to not only speak to you about one of your projects, but two, because there's, there, there was just too big a portfolio to pick from. So we had to at least cover two. <laughs> and um, I guess, well, you know, we'll come on to those projects very shortly. And just mm -hmm. to, again, just to sort of flesh out a little bit more about, I guess, what you do, but where that's come from. I mean, how mm -hmm. did you get into database? How did you find your route into this this world? And I guess, what is it about it that excites you or appeals to you as a as a professional? What appeals to me with database as a professional and how did I get into it? So I think as far as how I got into it, I would say there are... A combination of factors so if I go back to like the origins you know as a kid when I was younger in school my parents they put me in art school so you know painting colors drawing these are things that I had exposure to when I was younger and as I got older I didn't necessarily continue it like consistently but I still have it as a part of me and so naturally when I got into like the IT field and we're looking at charts and we're looking at graphs at this point it's just Excel, but you know, I always had this feeling like this chart looks ugly. Can we make it look better before we right. had it all the boss? So I would take that extra time to make it look nice and then forward, forward, forward continuously over time. I'm still working in the field of IT and I'll meet this fellow who He's like a Python guy. And so, you know, we talked about Python. We talked about Tableau. And then I found Tableau. And then I realized like over time that you can actually do a thing called data viz, where <laughs> the concept is literally representing data and then, you know, figuring out the best way to put that out there. And so once I realized like it has all these factors where you can actually start to design stuff, it's like, that's definitely what I want to do, right? Yeah. It's not that I don't like these other things that are there. But I feel like when you know something, you know something. And to me, it's just the feeling that I get when I do data viz. It's just there's a certain level of satisfaction that I have, which is really difficult to explain. But a friend of mine, he joked recently, like he doesn't see me retiring ever. And that's like <laughs> a running joke that I tend to say, because it's just when you know, you know. And for me with data viz, I just yeah. know I've done so many things in my life that this is where I know I want to be. So I'm grateful to have found it. It's still evolving and I'm glad that I'm here now today. That's fantastic. And it's not a dissimilar, I guess, kind of origin story to what I went through, which was the idea that I could have gone down the art route or the, 
So <laughs> let me not overplay that. I may not have made it as an artist. Let's just make that clear. But my instincts, my my appetite was definitely art and maths. And then by okay. finding this route and realizing that charts had this potential to bring in some of the artistry instinct. And then, as you yeah. said, the tools that now exist, I mean, Excel, you can still make beautiful things in spite of Excel. But I guess yeah, for many yeah, people, yeah. Tableau and some of the other tools like that kind of create this this actual canvas with which you can express yourself yeah, artistically exactly. and visually, but also usefully, you know, information, yeah. knowledge, that sort of stuff. That's so great true. to hear. And as I said, you know, your work does absolutely demonstrate that kind of artist um, mm -hmm. instinct or sensibility. And uh, the first piece we're going to look at is a project titled Incarcerated in America. And this was something that you worked on in 2021. The data yes. in the analysis is 2019. And yeah. this is something that is, um, there's, there's an interesting backstory that you explained to me. And we'll go into that about this piece in that it was, um, I guess, a, a, an opportunity for you to apply what you'd discovered in terms of inspiration from a course that you went on. So we'll come on to that in a short, in a short moment, but I must remember to ask you, first of all, to just basically describe this project. What do we see? If listeners aren't there right now looking at this piece, sort of paint a picture with words of what it is about and what it looks like. Okay. So this viz, which Andy and myself are talking about, it's basically looking at the incarceration incarceration rates in America across different races. So we have Black, White, Hispanic, and then another group called Other. And so the idea of the viz is to look at who is in prison proportionally by race, and then we're comparing that to the proportion of their race in the real population of America. And in doing so, we're able to realize that some particular groups of people have smaller representations in the real world, but disproportionately large representations with the criminals or, or people who are incarcerated in the prisons. And so that viz basically just highlights that in a way where we're able to see what's going on. So the idea is to show that information, start a conversation, and then we can now begin to look at what are the reasons for this happen. So that's a general description. In terms of the design itself, I went with something very non-standard from what you would see in a boardroom or, or right. even in even if you go to Tableau Public, there are not very many people who are doing that type of stuff. And so that's what kind of drew me to it. It's just a different style. It's more of like an abstract style of visualizations where we're not using line charts. We're not using, you know, area charts or bar charts. We're actually using shapes and other things to represent our data. And this cool thing that's called, you know, I learned from this course is called like a visual vocabulary. Yeah. So basically the shapes mean something and it's my job to tell you what they mean and utilize all that together to tell that story. So I don't know if you're able to build up a visual <laughs> picture of what it looks like, but at least you know what it's supposed to do. Um, it looks like a bunch of flowers yeah. in windows with cages around them. That's what it looks like. So if you, can, if you can visualize that. What I recommend, you definitely check out my profile because whatever you're thinking about, unless you've seen the viz, it's highly unlikely that what you're thinking of is what it is. Right, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And uh, there's an interesting thing you mentioned there about um, sort of triggering a conversation. And I, I think that's an important thing that, you know, we, we sometimes make these things and then we just sort of launch them, put them out there and just hope that something happens and I do think there's something about this style of work that we're going to explore in this piece which is it's not conventional as you said it's not necessarily something that is to be read but more to be felt and more to kind of trigger some kind of perhaps more emotional reaction than a just oh that's 12.5 percent or that's 19.5 percent and you mentioned that this style was something that you were inspired to perhaps practice and, and apply from attending a course by Federica Fragapani, which is wonderful to hear. Can you just tell me a bit more about that course and kind of what it was that really kind of got under your skin about this potential style to express yourself? Absolutely, um, Andy. I I think like you yourself, I'm sure you know Frederica. Like I think anyone who is a fan of database you've heard of her or you might right. not have seen whether or not you know it. And so for me, just 
with that desire and, and that love for beautiful database, it was inevitable that I encountered her work. And so as I'm getting to know more of what she's done, her background, somewhere along the line, I found out she's got a course on Domestica, where she actually goes through her process on how she creates these visualizations. And so it allows you to think about, you know, how you're going to show things, what you want to show, and even the physical hands-on steps mm -hmm. to go through the process. So to me, I think it was just the fact that when she approaches her data visits, I've not, I don't think I've seen her use a standard chart ever. Mm. I know she has, but I don't think I've personally seen it. Mm. However, you get to see her work. It's won numerous awards globally. So my point is her work is still able to connect with people in such a deep way, regardless of the fact that some of it is stuff that, you know, is not standard. And mm. so to me, that really appealed because I think why her work is so successful is like when you look at it, it just invokes like great feelings, like good yeah. feelings, like she does something really amazing. And so I wanted to be able to do that with my work where it's just like, you know, everyone knows what a line chart is and what a bar chart is, but trying to sit down, like it's like going to a museum and letting everyone have their own experience to try to interpret yes. what it looks like. And so that's kind of a lot of the stuff that she does, different shapes, components, brings them together in a really artistic way. And she breaks down all of that for us. And then she tops it off by allowing us to go through an exercise. And then she even actually went ahead and like this view you're talking about, she actually reviewed it. Like literally she made a comment on it and she said, this is what she thinks about it. So it was that in depth. I think a few people in the data fam have taken it. And I really encourage anyone to take it because it makes you think about how to represent information mm -hmm. and the ways that you can utilize different things to connect with your audience using the data and those visuals. That's right. And you mentioned the word before, uh, or the term before visual vocabulary. And again, it's, yes. it's, it's almost exposing ourselves to different language that we won't yes. perhaps traditionally use or are keen to learn how to use. And it just adds to your repertoire. You will still use bar charts, but now yes. you've got this extra string to your bow, you have this extra sort of option to, to explore and obviously uh, from memory a lot of Federica's work is um, kind of hand-drawn stuff in Illustrator and I guess another mm -hmm. side aspect to this is um, you know the topic is incredibly important and we'll come on to the motivation behind that in a second but as a chance for you to apply something that looks hand-drawn but with Tableau that's a that's a great practice opportunity mm -hmm. right? Yes definitely I think that's that's really what it is so those shapes and things that were utilized in that biz, all of them were done in the tool you just mentioned, which is Illustrator. And so it was like, that was a time in my life where I was, I was experimenting a lot, like all the design stuff. So I created the petals, Illustrator, and then the little um, stems as well, brought them into Tableau, colored them. And then it's more about using the map layers to place those things in Tableau. Oh, yeah. So it's like you said, it's, it's not a replacement for your standard charting. It is a tool that you could potentially have in your repertoire just as another variation of what you can provide right. to people and what you do. Yeah. Got you. And and just then sort of looking more towards the, the the subject matter, but also the the choice that you made to apply what you'd learned from Federica's course to this particular topic or this particular data set. What what was the opportunity moment that made you say, right, this is the thing I'm going to apply this new skill set to? Yeah, so it's, I think it was just figuring out and, and realizing that communication is really what it's all about. And so you can pick whatever it is that you want to utilize, right? Mm. I think she spoke of how she finds inspirations, like outside, like garden, like whatever the case may right. be, you'll take that. So you can basically take any object, right? And, you know, scale it out to represent like different magnitudes of stuff. And so because of that, the possibilities are endless. The only thing I would say is, you know, if you're going to use like, this is what we call a visual vocabulary, meaning you're creating something and you're defining what it means, right? So obviously your audience is not going to know what that is. So I would right. say every visual vocabulary needs to come with an accompanying dictionary yeah. in the form of a legend or something that lets people understand, yes, you've never seen this before. But by the time we're done today, you'll understand what we're trying to say here. And here's how you're going to do it. And then you show them. This means this. This means that. 
this color means that color this shape represents this thing and then you can literally just you know the only limit is what can you think of right how do yeah, you yeah. want to yeah, that's literally the only limit that you have with respect to that. And so I think it's, it's honestly really cool, particularly for people who have spent time doing a lot of standard work and you want to see like, okay, how can we spice things up? How can we do something different? That is one thing that you could look to because it's actually not difficult to implement. Yeah. It just requires a little bit of creativity on your part to say, what do we want to do today here? Absolutely. And with respect to the, the analysis itself and incarceration rates versus population, what led you to pick this analysis specifically mm. for this opportunity to express yourself? Um, what, what other possibilities were you exploring? You know, I, you know, maybe it wasn't just this that you were looking at to say, right, here's a bunch of data sets. Which one will I pick? What, what sort of drove you to, to this one in particular? It's, I would say that's a good question. And I think for me, when I was thinking about how to apply what I learned, I thought about a way to combine two different measures where one would be, you know, showing one thing and one would be showing another thing, but they're related. Right. And so I thought about, okay, what kinds of information? And so that's the first thing that came into my mind was, okay, well, we have two sets of people that exist but mm -hmm. two situations so mm -hmm. in this place here in prison we can look at this and in the population we can look at this and so then i thought okay where can we get something like this that information and i was like well the us is really great at keeping their information so us justice bureau and right there they have all the years i was like fantastic that's what i need so i just grabbed it um i think i need to do i had to do a little bit of cleanup but it was definitely just thinking about what's the easiest thing that I can represent mm. here? And so I thought prison population, population, and in the middle you have race. So that was kind of how that pulled in together. I'm sure there are other things like, let's say, you know, I mean, there's different types of analyses that you can awesome. do, but that was just something I wanted to do. Just like, you know, two groups of two, like one group, and then compare something that I already knew I wanted to do like flowers. I think that's yeah. what I should have said. Right, I already right. knew I wanted to do like flowers. And so it's like, what can I use to represent in the top and then at the bottom? So as I'm going through it, it's like the shape may come first or the idea may come first, but by the end of it, they're both going to fit together. I don't try to stress over what comes first. I just try to make it work by the end. Got you, got you. Yeah. And I mean, we'll get into the specific design choices in a, in a short while, but I'm, I'm curious about the 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 kind of early steps that you might take in a project like this do you do sketching do you do things offline analog before you get into a tool because obviously you know there's, there's a very deliberate architecture in the piece that we see there's a sort of almost like a, an instruction side and then there's yeah. a the content side and the content side is based on one two three by one two three four rows and three columns so it does have a very um a very kind of compatible architecture when you get into the actual thing itself. But did you know already, for example, that you might only select 12 crime types to give you that grid structure where you're sketching and just thought, well, it feels like this is going to be the, the general layout. How, what's the sort of process that you go through creatively before you get into perhaps Tableau and, and Illustrator? Okay. I think that's a good one. Um, I say this one, it just sort of worked out that yeah. there were 12 categories, for example. And then, you know, when we have work like that, where we need to show everything, my standard go-to would be small multiples. And so yeah. either a four by three to yeah. make it more, you know, um, horizontal, Landscape. yeah, yeah, three by four to make it more taller. And for visits like that, the taller looked better. So I didn't even think about it twice. I did it flipped it, and then I just continued on with that three by four, for example. So a lot of the decisions I make go based on how does it look to me mm -hmm. first, and then when I'm getting toward, when I've made decent progress, it's like, okay, let me step back. How does this look to someone else? And so mm -hmm. as far as design, I, I hate to, well, I don't, I don't know how to explain it, but like, I just thought about prison, flowers, pages and then just the ideas just started to come together right. because like you know prison 
associated with like doom, gloom. People yeah. are dying yeah. there. Yeah. Damn, hours, bloom, life, right? So it was yeah. like supposed to be a contrast between that. And so I already knew this is what I wanted to do. Like you said, I already had it like sketched off flowers and grid. And then it was a question of, okay, how do we make this happen in Tableau, right? And then you start to dig into the different right. techniques and methods. And then, you know, gradually it just started to come together. And I think the thing is as well, as people get more fluent in their tools or, or their preferred tools, let's say, that becomes your sketch pad, I guess, because the 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 friction between your idea and the thing that you can execute is so limited that you can yeah. flow. If I'm yeah. ever working with certain tools that I am quite new to using, it's not mm -hmm. as natural. So I will resort to pen and paper and then get back to it. And so, yeah, that, that sense that a, a sketchbook and pen doesn't need to be a literal sense. It can be the tool that you're using because that fluency just flows through. So that's it. Yeah. I mean, that's great. And I, I, I love those moments when you see, for example, 12 crime types. Mm -hmm. And in your head, you're thinking already three by four, four by three. Yeah, oh, yeah. perfect combinations. They work exactly so great. Right. Like, yeah, you're like my layout done. That's it. Easy. Yeah, it I was out. working with the data set this morning that had 400 things, 20 oh, by no. 20. Perfect, 20 by 20. Go, yeah. done. That's a lot of things. But um, at least you can fit it nicely. That's <laughs> right. right. So you start to become experts in sort of square roots of numbers and and things like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, as we get into the, the the design of this again, I'll, I'll I'll quickly sort of walk through the the general kind of architecture. We've got the the title, the intro, the how to read guide. And then we've got two summary statistics with this same sort of metaphor of the of the flower and the and the, the branches or the stems. The okay. first is the American population by race in total, which sort of sets the scene for this repeated stem structure, which is applied to all the different um, panels that we eventually see. Yeah. And then we've got the American state and federal prison population. Just on, on that one in particular, what was the thinking behind the inclusion of that particular statistic? It's not something that I realized was so skewed between state versus federal, but what made you think that it's important to to include that one? So I think that's like that's really what you just said there kind of alludes to the fact is like right. you hadn't seen that. I myself hadn't seen that. And I'm willing to bet a bunch of other people also hadn't seen that. And so it was just looking at that and seeing such a huge disparity you just know that's something that needs to be put out there. That's yeah. definitely a relevant part of the conversation. Yeah. And so I just knew that had to be added. And then the decision of where it is and all of that stuff was just more about thinking as far as design goes, you know, make it look nice while also allowing it to be for a specific function. Right. right? So functional aesthetics is what that came from. It's like, I definitely have to show that. And it gave me an opportunity to just like, add a bit more flair to the vis there because I, I think it looks nice like the legend is a thing that a lot of people just like do it and dump it but to yeah. me it's like a tool <laughs> to make things more aesthetic if you will yeah. so I, like a lot of my legends are not basic and so sometimes you see leverage stuff like that done but it's also communicating a relevant part of the whole story 100 percent, and, and i do think it acts as a reinforcing of that legend which has just been established at this point on the graphic so that mm -hmm. then you get into the main centerpiece crime charts yeah. you're yeah. already quite well educated now about what this is is standing for and there's yeah. a there's a lovely little sort of layout thing about the this this section with the state and the federal prison population which is this fact that the state feathers or flowers sorry the petals is so big that that yeah. already tells you where to put the little table and then more more there's no room <laughs> so it's got to be over on the left hand side and we, we do therefore make decisions about the empty space created yes. by yes. where charts are not as much as where charts <laughs> charts are, right? Exactly, um, exactly. And then on the right hand side, it, as I said, is the is the centerpiece. And you've already described it very well. We've got these petals, we've got these stems, there's four of each, one above the line to indicate the population of prisoners by race group, and then below to indicate the population at large. And what I love about the 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 design and, and the flow of the design is that above the line it goes um so in terms of colours, it goes blue, turquoise, um, sort of purple and pink, which is white, black, Hispanic, and others. 
but then it's reversed below so then you can continue that stem and yeah i, I wondered when did you <laughs> land on that but you know did you have a different sequence at one point or when did you get to that ah that's the way to do it so i think it's just again um going with trying out different things right so you put certain placements on the view and at least for the most part, like it's rare that you're just going to put something once and you're going to leave it there. Yeah. So it's just more playing around with things. And then also just noticing that with the particular placement, right? Like you said, when you're looking at the top part, the pedals are a bit curved. So when you look down, it just kind of flows and your eyes just follow. That's and so right. when you think about function and data viz, you want to make it as easy as possible for people to find things. Yeah. So that's again, just starting from the top, you can follow the line. Next one, follow the line. Next one, follow it just like that. Yeah. So it, it, it just gives you an easier direction. That's to look right. At it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then these flowers, as you said, are sort of in, imprisoned in these in these circles. And the, mm -hmm. the circles are sized for the total prison population, I think is correct, for that particular crime type. Right. Correct. Um, yeah. with, a, with a label and, and, a, and a, a, the, sort of the absolute number and the proportion of all crimes. And mm -hmm. I must admit, when I first looked at the graphic, I missed that circle detail initially. Uh, and then when I found it, it was like this really nice payoff. Oh, there's more. And <laughs> there's like another level of stuff going on there. And I, I wondered, did you ever make that circle level detail, I don't know, louder, shouter, more prominent? Or was it always quite, I don't know, quite subtle in its appearance? Because it does feel subtle, but... Yeah. better for it being subtle rather than trying to compete for attention with the with the flowers yeah so i think that you're right it was the subtlety was intentional right because it was supposed to blend in a little bit with the dark background yeah but also it's got like a, a, a light gray line around it just so that you can still see that it's there and so to me, it was the circle idea initially was just a bunch of equally sized circles mm -hmm. just to represent, again, the different cages or the windows that you're looking through and right. seeing the population in there. But then towards the end, I realized like there's actually another opportunity here. And so it's like, these are the prisoners. These are the crimes. These are the people. We can now make the circles the proportion of the total amount of people for that particular crime. And yeah. then I was and then resized it and then now i reordered it so that you can now see the biggest circle at the top left and then yeah. it just gradually so you can at least see you know from the order of largest to smallest who has the most offenders that are currently serving right. time got you yeah yeah and that sense of trying to squeeze out as much meaning from the arrangement of content is always a good thing to do yeah. rather than give people an alphabetical sorting which is quite arbitrary you know this makes makes a lot of sense now, quickly mm -hmm. running through some of the other design choices. Interactivity is, I think from memory, limited to just the kind of mouse over of the, the, the flowers. Yeah. Um, were you considering doing additional interactivity or was that always going to be limited to just some kind of details on demand? I, for this particular one, Andy, I actually knew that it was just going to be that tool tip. And right. as we talk about this, I actually just remember something now. So that tableau version that you're seeing mm. was actually made off of i have an identical viz that i made in illustrator and okay. that was that i did because like uh, frederica her tools are like illustrator and a few other things sure. so i actually her is using illustrator first and then moved it to tableau so to answer your question it was always supposed to be non-interactive mm -hmm. but then coming into tableau it was like okay there is opportunity to add some interactivity sure. add in the tool tip there because yeah there, there are not too many numbers yeah. on that but for people who like numbers it's like you've seen the visual but here it's easy access to the same information which you just saw visually so it's like a additional confirmation for them yeah. and that's the only reason why i had a tool tip there i never intended to but moving it into tableau you just kind of have to because it's like why not absolutely yeah yeah, yeah. um Next on to annotation, and I think what strikes me even more so now that you've talked about your background with that kind of artistic sensibility is your work is so characterized, in my view, with the care and attention to annotate things, to explain things, to introduce things, to not assume that the audience gets everything immediately, 
and mm-hmm. to not treat them like idiots, but to give them that that sense to sort of smarten them up along the journey. And you yeah. know, but there is a there is a lot here, but it's all useful. It's all worth including, whether it's the titles, the intros, the how to read guides. Mm-hmm. Again, it, it just on a broader basis, perhaps not just anchored to this piece. Is that a is that a I don't know a trait that you've brought more into your work the more you've done, or is it something that you always felt was an important thing? You always knew that you had to en- ensure that the audience was always informed about what to read, how to read it, what it's about, what you're seeing, what you're not seeing. Good question. I'd say that it's it's a bit of both in a sense that when I initially started doing data viz, right? So I would just make stuff. And then one of the biggest pieces of advice I got was put yourself in the shoes of your audience and then yeah. try to see how they see your work. Yeah. And so I would look at what I'm doing and then it would hit me like, okay, if I was somebody else, I would ask, what does this mean? And then that would lead me to now add in some type of annotation or legend, et cetera, et cetera. And then over time, practicing in the field, mingling with the data fam, interacting and having conversations, you kind of start to understand like, this is actually what you should be doing mm-hmm. like yeah. every time. And so I think that just sort of made it into a habit for me because I already kind of knew that it was something that was necessary. But then once it was confirmed, like this is going to take you from good to great and it's going to make it that much easier for your users, it then becomes a question of how can you not have a legend if you want yeah. people to connect deeply with your work so that to me is like honestly i consider that very core foundational yeah something i think is optional i think a legend is like a very very basic essential for data right right yeah absolutely um and the last thing i want to cover in terms of the design is is the color choices so we've got a, a, a dark background we've got some very um very sort of saturated nice intense colors we've got a nice blue we've got a turquoise i've already said purple and pink and then obviously yeah. the, the text is white through to some grayscale. Uh, just talk me through the kind of iteration of those choices. I mean, you could have had four colors that could have been <laughs> any four colors in a sense, but this feels like a nice, I don't know, kind of complementary color corner, shall we say, mm-hmm. of the color wheel. Yeah, thanks, thanks for saying that, Andy. And I think that's really what it is. It's like, you know, the whole thing with dark backgrounds is, you know, you know how when you make them, you put colors on them, colors just pop. So in my mind, it was like, okay, we have a dark background here and we were talking about a subject that isn't emotionally, you know, exciting, you know. Just one quick, very quick question, Chimdi. Did you start off with the black background as the starting point of your coloring and then work from there? Yeah, so I started off with the black background. I actually saw another, I do, I did create also one with a white background and then I went with the dark background because the colors popped a lot more on the dark background. Yeah. And that was the idea is like use beautiful quote unquote beautiful colors that are going to literally create visual excitement for people. Like just, it's a a negative subject, but I don't want you to look at it and add to your negativity. I want to sprinkle some, you know, little colorful bits and pieces for you there. Yeah. And in the middle of you realizing this is a really messed up situation, you can say, but it's shown really beautifully, right? And like, yeah. there's that part, it's like, you know, you like what you're looking at there. So yeah. it's that emotional balance, if you mm. will. Yeah. You're right. And and as you said before, the, the desire for this to be something that does grab attention and sustains that attention and informs mm. through its beauty is is the sweet spot that I guess we're all trying to strive for. Yeah. And the fact that, yeah. you've, again, you've, you've entered this with the idea of flowers being a metaphor to pursue and flowers are beautiful. So why not make the colors yeah. stand out and, and yeah, jump yeah. out the background of this, of this dark color scheme. It's a, it's a super piece. And I, I just want to kind of close off by acknowledging that this was a piece of work that um, achieved the viz of the day award. Is that right? Is that correct? Yeah. What was, what's, what was the, uh, Tell, because obviously not everyone who's watching or listening will understand what the vis of the day means, but it's a, it's a nice thing to achieve, right? Yeah, I definitely say so. It's it's so for those who don't know, vis of the day is a way for Tableau to basically just recognize things that fit different criteria, but it usually showcases the power of Tableau. There's some sort of aesthetic, beautiful aspect to it, and usually some kind of relevant topic being shown in there, and so. 
I'm willing to bet that in this case, so at the time, map layers was a new, a re relatively new feature. And so we hadn't utilized map layers in that way, you know, and for, about, for a lot of us. And so that was one of the things where it showcased like beauty in terms of database. It showcased technique in terms of Tableau. And so again, it's just another thing that draws people in. That's what yeah. Tableau is and they does. If you have a particular piece of work that is just really going to showcase the strength of Tableau while also being like a really solid piece with it. Like it's very highly likely that, you know, you'll get visit a day. And so it's, it's, it felt good for me. I, I personally, if I can confess a little bit, like this whole visit the day thing, it does excite in the moment, Yeah, but it's never been a goal. Like when I make data, it, it, it never occurs to me, is this something that can even make it right. beyond, you know? So whenever the visitor day comes, it's like, okay, that's some great feedback around what was mm. just done. And it, you know, we're all human. So obviously yeah, yeah. we love <laughs> work to be appreciated. And I, I used to pretend before, like not pretend, but like I've grown up in a way where like, I used to tell myself like, all this stuff doesn't matter. But then over time, I just feel like my heart softening a little bit. And <laughs> like, oh my God, that felt so good. I got this. <laughs> so, I mean, I, it feels good, but I, I tell people, don't worry about that kind of stuff. But it does feel good. Like, you know. Absolutely. <laughs> and uh, actually the last thing to ask about this is, I don't know, is anything on reflection that you would, given the circumstances, have the chance to redo, to do differently, to not do, to add to it? Or do you feel fairly content that, yeah, that was a finished piece of work and it should be remained in its current state? Mm, good question. I think, isn't that, that's something I think we always, we always, when we go back to our work, we try to think about, would we change anything? Yeah. And with respect to this one, when I look at it, I wouldn't say I would change anything because yeah, that's fine. at the time, like I, I had so many iterations of it that I knew like, this is just a piece of work that's one and done. Now, yeah. if you were to give me the same subject today to look at, I would probably look at it different, but for right. what it was at the time in terms of the goals and yeah. like everything there, I wouldn't change a thing. No. Perfect. Excellent stuff. Yeah, I now we're going to move on quickly to the second piece of today's uh, conversation. And this is another Tableau project titled WordPress Freedom Index. And this is looking at the the dire state of authentic journalism in 2023. And this is something that um, I've not written down the date, but obviously it came out this year, earlier this year. And yes. it's um, it, it's a nice contrast in style to the, the first piece we looked at, not least the fact we're looking at a, a white background and <clears throat> and something that's got perhaps in a sense a bit more writing going on there's you know there's almost a bit more kind of commentary going on with this but again as we did before for the benefit of the the, the listeners especially just sort of paint a picture for us chimney about what we're seeing here what it's uh, what it's about awesome so uh this particular is like andy said it's it's called the world press freedom index and it just highlights the state of journalism around the world by showing the current situation in different regions and countries around the world in terms of the situation we have you know different classifications like good satisfactory dire and i think the last one was basically very very bad right, right. so the right. and lights it uses a i guess this chart type is called a b swarm chart so it utilizes the b swarm to highlight all the countries so the idea was like we want to show all the countries that are available and then we're going to highlight the situation in each particular country. So that's like the main is. And then below that, we break out the countries into the different regions so that even though now we've seen the overall picture, we can start to see a little, a little bit more detail. How do things differ at the regional level? And so we utilize the same chart and then we've just kind of laid out the different regions below that. And then we're showing the countries in each region. And then we're also showing the overall median score per region so that you can say these many countries are in these kinds of situation, but overall the entire region is in this situation. Yeah. And then overall the whole world is in this situation. So it's just like a progressive analysis of, you know, the different dimensions there. And it does show that as of right now, unfortunately, majority of the world is not in a good situation. Yeah. So that's kind of 
solution that comes from that is it's not in a good state right now. In fact, it, it's only just struck me that given there's five levels or groupings and mm -hmm. only one of those is good. <laughs> I mean, yeah, even exactly. satisfactory is not great. Um, yeah, and everything yeah. is kind of in this middle problematic zone, which is, yeah, it's it's not a great story right now, is it, obviously? But um, the, 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 the motivation or the background to this was um, a Makeover Monday challenge. Correct. Right? Okay. And again, you know, we've talked about Viz the Day for Tableau. Could you just give people a sense of what this Makeover, Makeover Monday thing is? Because... I love it. Yeah. I've never taken part, but I love that it exists, and I love the the people yeah, behind yeah. it because it's such a great way to practice and yeah. and and see what others do to a problem. But let me let you speak to it. What's uh, what's Makeover Monday? Absolutely, Andy. I think you 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 basically just kind of at that last bit there. You kind of highlighted what the core is. Is a great way to practice databases while also learning with the community, right? So it's been going on now for about. What's this? Twenty? I'm gonna say 2016. Yeah, it feels around then. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, Andy Kreeble and Eva Murray, they they started this, and they've essentially just committed so much time. Right. The way it works is we look at one particular visual that was made by someone else. It could be a great visual already, or it might be something that could use improvement. I think that's now, an important thing. And sorry to interrupt yeah. again, but I, I think yeah, it, and this is a broader point to make about all redesigns of visualizations it's not always that yes. something's bad or problematic exactly. or wrong it's just that there's yeah. other ways to skin a cat there's other ways to do it so yeah sorry go ahead yeah no that's exactly it. so that's really yeah. what it boils down to is how would you visualize this kind of information yeah and so the cool thing about it and why i i really encourage a lot of people if you want to stimulate yourself mentally and even inspire yourself to be consistent that is is a very good thing to look into Makeover Monday. Why? Because you already know this is how I might look at this information. We know ourselves best. But in looking at how other people have done it, how they've also executed, you get to see the other possibilities. Yeah. And then on top of that, you actually get to see reviews and feedback from the yeah. experts. So there's the Viz review portion where they look at the business and they give you feedback on what's good and what's not so great. And then finally, there's the Watch Me Viz, where Andy, who is just probably the greatest Tableau user there is right now, he's actually building his live. So it's this whole production. It's like, yes, yeah, we're just building stuff on Twitter, but it's a lot more than that. This is yeah. changing lives every single day. And there's so much that you get to see coming out of that. If you see someone who is doing good stuff on Tableau Public, there's probably a 90% chance that that person did make over money for a while. At yeah. least that's what I've noticed. And yeah. so to me, it's the same thing when I feel like I'm jonesing for a database and you not always have the time to commit to a personal project. There's like thousands of data sets you can go to and articles that you can read for, you know, a background on everything. So it's just fantastic. You put your work out there, you share, you inspire, and you yeah. build your portfolio at the same time time like we can go on and on about the benefits but i don't want to make your call go off <laughs> but, hours, but yeah. no absolutely and that's a that's a great scene setter for this and i i can't remember the exact original charts that this article when it was launched i think it was in the guardian originally um a report and i'm just wondering what kind of what was the first point that you got into this and Mm -hmm. Add that sense of, okay, here's what's been done already, or yeah. here's the data that's been made available in this article and by uh, reporters without boards, reporters sans frontier. Um, yeah. You know, what, what was the trigger point? Think, right, yeah, that's that's not working for me, or here's the opportunity with the data. What, what was that sort of seed that started this ball rolling? Yeah, so it's, it's I think, again, this particular one, it wasn't a bad viz, but it also right. wasn't a great viz so this yeah. one there was actually a lot of room to expand on things i think it was just like grouped bar charts across the right. years yes i do remember now yes how many people were in each situation right yeah so their approach was to show something really high level and aggregated yeah my approach was to say you know if someone looks at that i just tableau is so global people are yeah. going to be wondering what's happening in my country my yeah. region and so that's just a better way to connect with people, make it relate to them. So I surfaced all the locations in mind, and I just gave that extra detail for anyone who's sort of curious. And then 
they can see and compare with everyone else to kind of have that, you know, overall perspective on, on, on the world. Globally. Right. Sure. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, obviously the, the centerpiece, as you've described, is this is this bee swarm plot. And I just mm -hmm. wonder at what point did that chart emerge as the way to show this? Did you experiment with others? I mean, it's 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 all about distribution. It's about range. There's dot plots and there's histograms that could have been used. But what even a map, I guess a map could have been explored. But, yeah, exactly. um, you know, what was the kind of early point at which you were experimenting with other methods other than the one that we see on the okay. result? So I, I will say, first of all, I kind of cheated for this question because when I put to the <laughs> someone asked me that, so I'll give you the same answer. <laughs> right. <laughs> it was basically just like the idea to not obscure anybody, you know, mm. in that. So we had, I don't remember exactly how many countries. One of the beautiful things about the bee swarm is that it will show all your distributions without overlapping, where yeah. something like, say, even a scatter plot might have been able to show that information, but you have the overlap. Yeah. Yeah. That's the part that I wanted to avoid. And that's why the bee swarm came into part because it's like everybody is relevant here. Every data point must be visible. Right. Yeah, absolutely. My main choice there. I didn't. I didn't look at too much because you know it was either just like, I mean, and on the map it could work if you use like small circles maybe for each data point. But you know, a map is something that it's a controversial chart in my. Well, it opinion. is because yeah. countries are the same shape, they're not the same size. Yeah, uh, you know, on a map, um, if you've got a dot. For Canada, where do, where does that go? Is it right in the middle? In the is middle. It, of is it where the capital is? You know, it, it's a really, yeah. and and I do think in general terms, and I've talked a lot about this on these podcasts, which is just because you happen to have locations doesn't mean to say that the spatial dimension is the thing that's yeah. the story. You, yeah. you, you know, we've got 180 countries here, so that's 180 yeah. distinct categories. You know, that, yeah. that's, I that's one way to look at it. People who can read like a map. Yes. Oh, so that's another aspect of it too. Absolutely right. Yeah, absolutely right. And as you said, we've got the the, the sort of main centerpiece is the, the total collection of all countries on this bee swarm spread across the page from the very serious through the difficult, problematic, satisfactory and good. Um, yeah. Looking at the number, we've got North Korea in the bad place and Norway yeah. in the good place. Norway's always up there for some reason. They always do a good, yeah. <laughs> they always do a good job in Norway. <laughs> Exciting place, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, before that, we've got a bit of introductory text. We've got the kind of legend to establish the color associations, a bit of description for each of these five different um, bandings. And then, as you said, yeah. we've got separate filtered bee swarms for each of the major regions like North America, Middle East. We've got e uh, Eastern Europe and Asia Central. So there's um, there's this sort of repeated um, graphic there. And you mentioned um, in launching this piece, I recall there was a tweet that followed to to praise the work of Tristan Gullivan, who'd developed yes. this yeah. um, sort of, uh, I guess, a toolkit slash tableau solution that can be reappropriated. Let's yeah. uh, let's celebrate Tristan. So, I mean, you know, was again, I suppose, the chicken and egg question was the availability of that toolkit another reason to pursue this particular chart type? Yes, one thousand percent, I would say so. <laughs> Because for each individual bee swarm that you saw, mm -hmm. it was a new set of, like, I was going to break up the data into different things, do some data prep, and build a new bee swarm each time. Right. And so, I kid you not, each one took me, like, I'm going to say maybe, like, 10 minutes max. Mm -hmm. it's, it's that effective, the tool that he's built there. Right. So. I think I I'd, I'd used I'd used it before, and so I already knew of its existence, and I just felt like this is something that would make this piece less, you know, um, like it's less work for me to put it out there, even though it yeah. is, an, even though it's a bit of an elaborate piece, right? So that was that's like really what it is is we want to do things, but if there's a simple way to you to do things, why not do it? And I exactly think that's. Right. Yeah, Tristan is, I think he's made that his mission, right? I, I don't know what it is that inspired him to do this, but 
I think that every one of us is just like, man, whatever it is, we support you. <laughs> whatever Thank you for that. Yeah, yeah. We're going to support you. Just keep doing what you're doing, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. No, it, it is. And it's, it's got other packages for other, you yeah. know, some of these unusual chart types with bendy lines and sankeys and stuff. He's, he's got a, a great... He's done a great job for everyone there. So yeah, thank you to Tristan. Um, yeah. Actually, just one thing you mentioned there about time. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess there's a question for this and the previous piece as well, which is given that these are not um, client pieces of work, they're not mm -hmm. uh, workplace tasks with other people shouting at you to say, get that done. I mean, do you, do you set your own deadlines? Do you sort of impose your own artificial constraints to challenge yourself to say, right, I'm going to do this in two days. And if it takes longer, bad luck to me, you know, that that's just the way it is. What, how do you kind of manage the time? Or do you, do you just go for it and see when it finishes? Um, I think initially I would do a lot of time boxing mm -hmm. to say, let's get it out by this time. Mm -hmm. Um, for this piece, I didn't do that. And I found over time, I don't do that for my personal stuff. Right. It's necessary at work, but personally, no. And the reason is because I noticed that, let's say I start working on something on Monday and right. it's ongoing by Wednesday or Friday, I might've had like two to three new ideas and changed everything. <laughs> and so... To me, I don't believe in rushing anymore. It's like, I want to put out quality content mm -hmm. in the community. I want to challenge myself in whatever way I want to challenge myself. And so I'm just going to do it. And then when I feel it's done, then I'm just going to put it out there, right? And then if I want to get feedback from someone, I will give them the viz at the point where I'm done my iteration. And then yeah. if their feedback requires me to make any changes, then I'll go ahead and make those changes. Yeah. But I think... If it takes me now a week to do something, I'm absolutely comfortable. I've heard so many conversations with people in the community about how sometimes you just kind of iterate and iterate and you're just like, what am I even doing? Yeah. And so I no longer feel weird about that. I used to think like, man, you don't know what you're doing if it's taking you this <laughs> long to do this biz. But it's just more about because it's a passionate project, a passion project, you mm. want it to be how you want it to be. You mm. know what? share with people and you want to like package it really nicely for them so i think that just drives a lot of my thing now is just get, get it done like I've, i have a makeover monday i've been sitting on now for it's been almost a month i promised myself okay put it out this weekend get it done the reason why it isn't done yet is because i finished it three different times and then each time i come back it's like oh but you can do this <laughs> so i embrace that now yeah. i think it's creative process and like let's say you iterate of this four or five times those are four or five ideas that you didn't use today you can use yeah. later yeah. exactly right that that recyclability of ideas um you know there's i don't think there's any blind alley that's a bad blind alley um i think there's always benefit in things that you try that don't kind of work out for this situation you might reuse them again later but yeah. also you know again you talked before about the that kind of artistic sensibility that mm -hmm. is the sort of backstory there. Any artist asked the question, when is something finished in their mind is always quite an enigmatic answer. It's, it is often a feeling. It, it is something where you just inside say, done. Yeah. Don't exactly. touch it anymore because any further touching or tweaking might break this, leave it. And it, it's yeah. a hard thing to try and, uh, to tell other people what signs to look for other than very mechanical have you done this yes or no there is just mm -hmm. a sense of done voila finished exactly. move on yeah, yeah. and totally just again just sort of running through some quick uh, design choices the the interactivity for this again is a really helpful and niche and actually a very detailed tooltip as you mouse over the countries um I can't remember all the details that are in there, but we've got things like the um, the ranks, the scores of each country, but also an embedded area chart for yeah. what what the story was before. And uh, yeah. you know, I, again, I'm just thinking that the choice to put things in a tooltip already suggests that you're saying that these have kind of got a secondary importance. But were you ever tempted to bring some of that detail to the top surface level and? I don't know, turn this into multiple tabs rather than just a single snapshot or a very, very long piece of work or a very, very wide piece of work. 
how, how can you sort of reconcile that secondary on-demand detail chart? Yeah, good question. I think that that's just more of there. There's going to be a personal preference aspect to it, sure. but also in this to, to answer specific to this particular viz, there it was more about the consistency, right? So, for example, if you see five B swarm charts, by the time you get to the second or third B swarm chart, your mind is already in the flow of like how you're interpreting this information. Yeah, yeah. you didn't want to disrupt that with yeah. new stuff and so i put all the high level stuff even though it's a lot of high level stuff i put it at the top but then and going back to those questions that are going to be naturally coming how did they do over time how did they change how do they compare now that information is still available except mm -hmm. it's in the tooltip so mm -hmm. you have a lot of information but it is not presented in an overwhelming way yeah. which is how I tend to feel when I see someone that just like gives you everything on the page. It's like, sure. how would you feel if you walked into the store and I just threw the entire, you know, collecting at you and told you to pick one, right? That's not, you know, you would need to work your way through things. And I believe information absorption is the same way. If you want it to stick, you give gradual, right? And then you allow them to find what they want. And that's the cool yeah. thing about the tooltip. The tooltip is there. They know it's there, but they're only going to go there if they care about what's in it. That's right. And, and we can get paralyzed into thinking, I could show the range of all these values, but they there's available data of a time as well. So I could show both. And then you end up showing everything and that in turn yeah. shows nothing, I guess. So yeah, you're right. I think that flow of, I've got an interest in the country. I'm going to hover over it. Oh, what's the story for that country? Not get too exactly. caught up in what what's everyone doing? What's, yeah. this, what's this story? And I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, the color choices. So again, we've got a white background, but we've got some really, again, very elegant um, sort of deep reds, browns, light browns, um, sort of kind of gray blue, light blue. Uh, and they're just ever so elegant, as well as all the other app apparatus around the blacks and subtle whites and gray scales. And you've got such mm -hmm. a, a wonderful touch for this, um, the, the, the monochrome elements of this as well, which I love. But same questions before what led you to those five specific colors for the main five categories yeah that one i think this one is, is a bit of an easy answer for me it was like again this is not a positive topic and so if, again my contribution to this type of stuff is let's add some beauty into the mix mm -hmm. right so i went with colors that they kind of work together but they also contrast each other in a way where you can see what they're representing yeah so like bad situations are more of like the maroons and like sure. the browns and then you start to move towards the more positive where it's like the lighter blues and the darker blues yeah. so that's really what it was it's like i think i built out the palette individually with i think the five different colors sequentially in the order that i wanted to show them and so yeah. i did a bunch of testing beforehand and so i already felt like this is going to work well and then i just transferred that palette into the different gradual categorizations in the visit. So again, it's arti artistry with a little bit, you know, like actually more artistry and function being brought together, yeah. right? It's so a background, let's highlight these beautiful colors, but also there's a function. Once you start to see the blues, you're now getting the feeling like, okay, things are getting better now. Yeah. And then you, the other way, it looks like we're getting worse because it's yeah. getting darker, redder, you know, like, like all that kind of stuff. So absolutely. that's how I this palette, does that, does that give you an idea of sort of how that came together? Uh, absolutely, 100%. And, you know, obviously it's a, it's another of those design features that can be very subjective. You know, there isn't the single color palette, but we, we just have to find a way that at least connects with us that we can then justify it to, to how we hopefully have the audience experience that as well. Um, I, I think to, to close off this piece, Chimney, I, I guess I'm going to ask you just a, a question of what's your favorite bit? <laughs> is there a favorite little detail, favorite little choice? Is there something that you went through that we don't see or appreciate that you thought people need to know I went through this and this is the the outcome of it? <laughs> um what was the outcome? What was something here? I would I would say that it's just more when when I'm committed to like a theme, I tend to try to go like so for this one I wanted, you know, it's about media freedom. Mm -hmm. So obviously I'm thinking about journalism, yeah. Thing. 
And so I'm like, okay, can we make a vis that's kind of like, you know, a bit of a newspaper report, something you can see. It like absolutely looks like a newspaper piece. Yeah. yeah. So that was, that was honestly what I wanted to do with that one. And so I, I got feedback specifically around that without me asking someone said that. And so that really like, I was like, okay, mission accomplished. Thank you. So that was, that's what it was to me for this one. It was just like, that's what I wanted you to see is like, this mm -hmm. is a new piece about media freedom. And so hopefully that was kind of how it came off to people. It's like, you know, yeah. Absolutely. And also I will say, I will say like the, the details thing to me, like, um, I just want to say maybe I, I, I think maybe some people don't necessarily appreciate like how much that could do for them. So like what I mean by that, when you think you're done, stare at your work, just like stare at it without the intent of anything. And you're going to see things that jump out. And like, to me, that's kind of something with this one is I, I'm getting more and more drawn to white backgrounds because you're getting to see everything like, you know, if something isn't where it's supposed to be, I yeah. find it's easier to find out on a white back. Cause like dark backgrounds are like, technically they can work with a lot of things and a lot of that's colors, right. but if yeah. white, that contrast is like, if it's not that you will know. So I think it's just looking at the work and seeing this is balanced, Like right? Balance is huge for me in my data. That was my next word. Cause yeah. I think that you've got a, a real, a real eye for balance and and again what i'm currently looking at on my screen is a thumbnail view of this image and when you uh, there's you know there's a thing there's a thing in art called the squint test if you sort of squint at something and, and let it blur you sort of see the main shapes and balance and the the squint yeah. test for this absolutely passes because you've got the things that are loud and big and dominant that need to be the title the boldness yeah. of some of those words in the captions the yeah. the empty space that you Again, your your talent to use empty space is brilliant. That is such a skill because it's the it's the visual punctuation mark. It's the commas and the pull, full stops that we have in this. So the evenness yeah. of the layout of things is is wonderful. And then the balance below of the the sequence of the regions with the sort of bad stuff happening. And then we move a little bit more positive, and then we've got the yeah. summary. So yeah, as a, as a as a piece of harmony, balance, visual grace, it's uh, it's. It's wonderful. So I, you know, I, I tip my hat to you, sir. And I want to then just sort of close off with this sort of bigger picture view. Just obviously, mm. there's only two years between these two pieces, and yeah. your portfolio goes much deeper in terms of the the age of work. But I wondered yes. how you would reflect because you know you've talked about like the first piece was driven by being on a course when you went to apply what you've learned. How have yeah. you changed? So over the last four or five years, how have you changed in terms of your techniques? What do you do more of or less of? What do you like doing? What do you dislike doing? I mean, you've just <laughs> said there that you might be moving a bit more towards typically white backgrounds because of what you expressed yeah. there. I mean, yeah. are you able to sort of take a helicopter view of yourself and where where you've, where you've changed or evolved? Okay. No, I think that's a good thing to reflect on. And I feel like we all evolve over time mm -hmm. and, how I've seen my change myself change mainly is when I started, I would focus a lot on beautification with respect mm -hmm. to design. Now I focus a lot more on functional design. And so a lot of that means holding back from doing some things that I want to do, meaning, you know, white backgrounds. I like those because they're simple, they're mm -hmm. plain, they're clean. And I think like with, with data viz maturity comes with understanding that less is more. Mm. And so mm. I think that's the biggest evolution for me is just being, you know, I always try to be minimalistic where I can. Yeah. But if there is something on the viz that is not useful, you're just not going to see it on there. Yeah. Even if it means my work is sparse, yeah. right? Because I've just, I've, I've talked to a few people and I've tested myself where I'm looking at someone's viz. It's like a fantastic viz that with lots of information, but they put something there that is just not clear what it's there for. Mm. And you get stuck on that thing. Mm. And like human beings are weird. They're going to forget everything else that's there. And they're gonna ask you, what is that nonsense? <laughs> not nonsense, but they're going to be like, what yeah. is that thing? Yeah. So to me, that's the biggest change is I try to eliminate distractions. So yeah. I don't focus on design for beautification, but when yeah. you look at my charts, a lot of the time you see my charts look different from if someone else were to make the same chart sure. because I put my design on the function. And then if that uplifts the aesthetics, that's a bonus. I do mm -hmm. always focus on this. 
but I think that's it for me. It's like function over, you know, superfluous stuff. Like don't color it pink and purple just because you think pink and purple is beautiful, right? Yeah. You, you can do that from time to time, but yeah. I just think about things in a way of like, you know, let's say you want to color a bar chart pink mm -hmm. and you also know you can color it gray. Mm. Color it gray and move on. That's the mature thing to do. Right? <laughs> <laughs> That's good for me. Like, I just try to be mature with my work. Is like don't don't overcomplicate it. Keep yeah. it was better so that's how that's how i see myself changing is like i try my best not to overthink i try to let go of the perfectionist mindset and i just try to you know make sure that i'm just you know still having fun like i don't think i want to change the fun aspect yeah i don't sure. think I stop playing around but i try to be very functional now and that's because i'm focusing on like i know my new my audience is just showing Here's how you can use Tableau to design stuff. So lately, I'm not using too much Illustrator, too much whatever. And like, it's just in the title, but everything else is Tableau. And oh, that's, yeah. that's what I do now is like, if you want to know how to design in Tableau, look at my stuff. I'm going to try to show you as much as I can with yeah. what's working for me. So that's where I'm at now is stretching Tableau from a design yeah. perspective while also maintaining a little bit of the standard of work that I'm doing in terms of quality and, and visual appeal. Absolutely. No, that's that's a great summary. And I think it's a, a really nice mindset to get into. Uh, and it, obviously, it reflects a certain confidence that one gets when you've had a, you know, a degree of experience in this stuff that you don't need to try so hard to make things beautiful. It just happens as an outcome of your choice making. And yes. Again, that balance of minimalism, it's not minimalism for the sake of it. It's about making sure that everything's there to serve a purpose. And I think, you know, for me, a lot of the design thinking that I've been inspired by down the years has always often come from things like product design, you know, mm. where things that aren't That's worth incredible. including that, you know, I just got rid of because it's expensive or it's distracting for the function. So yeah, I think that's a, a great way to summarize things. So wonderful. Yeah. Listen, Chimdi, thank you ever so much for going through those two pieces and for talking about your, you know, your background and, and where things are developing and look forward to seeing the next things that come out. But for now, thank you, sir. Very much nice to meet you. And thank you all the listeners and viewers out there and see you again soon on another episode. Bye for now. Thank you. It's been a great. Thank you so much and see you next time. Thank you. To see more information about today's episode, including some links to key sites and resources mentioned, please visit my website at visualizingdata.com. Here, you'll also be able to find details about my book, information about my public and private training courses, as well as over a decade of blog posts. If you've enjoyed this series, please consider liking, subscribing and spreading the word. See you next time.